There are now something like 40 national academies and large umbrella scientific organizations around the world have made statements like this in support of alarmist climate change. Not one case have they polled their members. Those societies are run, like all fairly large organizations in our community, by politically active people with an axe to grind. You will all be aware of the power of the argument they now deploy. Show me, Professor Carter, they say, show me a National Academy of Science that doesn't think this is a problem. And I can. It's actually Russia. But I have to admit there's 15 that have signed on the dotted line for the Royal Society on the other side. Well, you're lucky. Your daughter's so bright, she's not going to have to go into the grubby world of commerce at all. She's going to go to a university. And she'll have to apply for research money. So she'll apply, this is the British National Environment Research Council, or if she was in, uh, in Australia, the Australian Research Council, in New Zealand, Ministry of Research, Science and Technology, National Science Foundation, and in Canada, uh, National Science Engineering Research Council. And she would apply for money, and her grant application will be refereed by experts in climate science. And she wants to investigate uh, whether this is true or not. And here's what one of the referees said in a real example for one of those funding agencies a year or so ago. The applicant appears to be keen to dispute in the popular press the scientific evidence linking recent global scale warming to increasing greenhouse gas temperatures. While the freedom of the press means he can write what he wants in the newspaper, it'd be better if he published scientifically correct statements in his newspaper articles. His statements are incorrect. There's no appeal for this. It's not appropriate to fund the scientists who continues to publish scientifically erroneous statements in the public press. I've retired from active science. I can stand up in public and say these things. Against that background, can you imagine any 30 or 40 year old scientist in mid career saying anything publicly about global warming in a critical way? Well, she didn't get a research grant. So she had to leave the university in the end. She was only on temporary lectureship, not good enough to get a research grant, so she can't stay there. So she's now forced to take a job with the government. Wonderful superannuation, as long as it lasts. And she might work for the Australian Greenhouse Office, which produced this gargantuan report in 2002 on climate change. She might join CSIRO. They went around the country three years ago. Very nice business, thank you. Taking a lot of money off the state governments to do climate change predictions for each state. And after they'd done them, the Premier of the state, in this case New South Wales, gets up in public, or car, and he goes on and on. He says, global warming is an imminent serious threat. Is. It will mean, it will mean, not it might mean, it will mean more frequent droughts, especially in winter, and more intense heavy rainstorms. The imaginary computer models that CSIRO provides, and CSIRO is very careful not to say that anything beyond projections, they're not predictions, they're not forecasts, are turned instantaneously by the politicians and the press into predictions. And she might join Queensland, and Queensland recently did a report, starts off by saying climate change is happening now, a uh, statement of such breathtaking inanity, you can't imagine anybody writing, it's like saying the sun rose this morning. And furthermore, the climate is changing at a faster rate than pre <coughs> previously anticipated. Nana Bly, it's not rising faster as it happens than anything you can imagine. These sorts of statements, I just think we're awash with them. They have no scientific basis whatsoever. <clears throat> She's finally forced to join the grubby world of business. And there she finds Mr. John McFarlane, who likes to call himself, believe it or not, I think he said this with a straight face, a sensitive capitalist, not a greenie. And he ran this article, they ran this article in the uh, bulletin magazine about him, and he was quoted to say, well, the debate among science about climate change continues, it's unimaginable to conclude otherwise than the pumping of a massive amount of carbon, and he means carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere is damaging our planet and potentially. So we're now going to set future climate policy on the basis of what a banker can and can't imagine, aren't we? Well, there you have it. That's the sociology, and here's my opinion on how it happens. I could give you a whole hour's lecture on how does it happen. Here's three thoughts. It starts on the biggest villains of these guys and their counterparts. Most people have no conception how powerful they are or how much money they have. 
These figures go back to 2002. This was in the US alone. World Wildlife Fund had uh, almost 500 million, Greenpeace had 250. Add it up, it's, it's well over a billion dollars, and it's probably now, uh, six years later, over two, two billion dollars these people have each year to spend on what? To spend right. exactly on what these guys do in an election campaign. And you've all seen how much saturation coverage you get and how effective the techniques now used by modern advertising and media techniques are. Well, reflect on the fact that in the same year that these figures were true, we had an election in Australia and a total of 80 million, less than 10%, was spent on that whole election. So problem number one is the unbelievable amount of money that is going in to advertising and propaganda by the leading uh, non-governmental organisation. Problem number two is this. Recognise these guys? And one gal? What have they got in common? That's a good question. They haven't all got spectacles. Kate doesn't need those yet. They're all sincere. I actually don't want to, there's no point in poking fun at their sincerity. I think they believe what they're preaching. And they've got absolutely zero side of the expertise. What about these people? Oh, who's that lot? I haven't seen them on BBC, ABC television. Well, it happens, Roy Spencer and Fred Singer are two of the outstanding, they've been the top 5% of atmospheric scientists worldwide. Outstanding, distinguished professional climate scientists. This gentleman is the Dragon Slayer, Stephen McIntyre, who knocked out the hockey stick, and this gentleman, Timei Hamaranta, is a, sweet, a Finnish lawyer who ran a climate skeptics uh, website called Climate Skeptics for many years. How many people are rich by these opinions of the top line? Millions? No. Tens of millions? No. Hundreds of millions of people are influenced by the views of these people. How many people are influenced by a few thousand? And they are viewed as such a daily threat by the green pieces in the World Wildlife Fund that, of course, all of these people and people like me are under heavy attack the whole time. So problem number two, and how did it happen? It happens because celebrities in our society, which is all the press are interested in printing about, have been indoctrinated, basically, by the environmental agency. Sorry, I left out. These people are all equally sincere. It just happens they've got deep expertise. The third way it happens is this. This is a think tank in London, Institute of Public Policy Research, with close connections to the Labour Party. Uh, a couple of years ago, they did a, a, a paper called Warm Words. Uh, how are we telling the climate story? Can we tell it better? The task of climate change agencies, they say, is not to persuade by rational argument. Instead, we need to work in a more shrewd and contemporary way using subtle techniques of engagement. The facts need to be treated being so taken for granted they need not be spoken. Everybody knows global warming's happening. That car must be crazy. Ultimately, positive climate behaviours needs to be approached in the same way as marketeers approach acts of buying and consuming. It amounts to treating climate-friendly activity as a brand. <coughs> this is, we believe, the root of mass behaviour change. Remember other people in the 20th century, 20th century that want mass behaviour change? Yeah, who cares about this? It's just an obscure London think tank. Yeah. And these are the people that read the report and were already putting into effect those very techniques, as indeed are our politicians today. Mr. Blair and his spinmeister, Alistair Campbell, honed the technique to perfection. Kevin Rudd is hoping he's going to do it better. Prepare to be amazed. That's pretty wall to wall, isn't it? It'd be pretty hard for anybody to know anything about science to resist all of that and come out at the end skeptical. 